all of them have been rebuilt at least once, and some, like those around Chicago, have to be almost constantly patched and resurfaced. When you compare the Roman roads, whose huge paving stones and elegant bridges seem untouched by the millennia, it's hard not to think that our modern methods are lacking. If you hear any snoring, I'm really sorry, it is Floss who's over there snoring away. And she won't stop, will you? She has to do it, she has to ruin my videos, don't you? Anyway, let's get on with this. Um, today, at these two videos, and use just a little bit of their footage, because I just wanted to explain that when I was much, 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 much younger, um, probably married, two little kids, maybe three kids by then. I saw a documentary and it basically said, just like one of these videos, that this bottleneck happened where flourishing, bottleneck, and then flourishing. But in the bottleneck, the um human uh, population had nearly, um, oh, dear me, stop that, uh, the, pop, the human population had basically almost gone, and in one of these videos he talks about basically a thousand people being left, and that's basically what the document documentary said, but I'm sure but I'm sure that they said it was because of an imploding volcano, or their theory was. But basically it was because the amount of dust it put out, the amount of dust caused it to kill everything. Not the dust, the, you know, the ash, the falling of the ash. Um, just basically killed everything. Um, there's another one there, but we didn't look at that one. I looked at this one and this one. So we're going to watch this video, and you know, later on, basically, Mount Tambora, Tambora happened. Now, that was supposed to have been the biggest volcano explosion in the world, causing mass devastation. It's very strange. When I look at the little pictures, I'll just let them play. But you don't, you just see, it's this localised tsunami. And it took till the following year for it to cause the year without the summer. So how does that happen if it happened in 2000, and, sorry, if it happened in 1815? It took till the following year for it to affect the weather. And I'm not sure whether I copied it, but in here it said, because of that volcano, it took three years for things to start returning back to normal with the weather and everything so if that's what happened you know the tsunamis and that had to be worse maybe this is one of the mud floods here but anyway just let the video play out thanks very much and the little bit of information from both these channels that go and watch their whole videos um, thank you very much to those creators. Anyway, let's just play the little video. 
1972, a shocking study came out, claiming that between 35,000 and 65,000 years ago, a genetic bottleneck had occurred in humans, meaning that something had caused the population of humans to reduce so much that it extensively limited our genetic diversity today. At the time, no one really had a good idea of what this something could have been. But during the 1990s, scientists started to connect it to a massive volcano that erupted 74,000 years ago, Lake Toba. The idea was that this eruption, which took place in Indonesia, was so violent that it had a catastrophic effect on humans, with estimates finding it to have had an explosive power 10,000 times more powerful than the eruption of Mount St. Helens, leading to the evisceration of local areas and causing severe change in climate that ultimately pushed humans to the brink of extinction. with roughly only 3,000 to 10,000 individuals surviving, allowing scientists to take a glimpse into the past, so to speak, which revealed that this major die-off left a surviving population as low as 1,280 people, meaning that humanity saw the extinction of 98.7% of the entire population. So I've been reading an article in Nature about how human ancestors in Africa nearly went extinct around 900,000 years ago. So this is a paper published in Science, and it talks about how the entire population of our ancestors, long before the emergence of Homo sapiens, reduced down from around 100,000 individuals to just 1,280 breeding individuals. And it stayed like that for around 117,000 years. Oh, is this stuff that they know from fossils presumably it would be pretty hard to estimate numbers from that so that's an interesting question that this research sort of answers in some ways so this hasn't been worked out from fossils or from archaeological evidence but from a new model used to predict past human population sizes using 3,000 present day human genomes okay so looking at the genomes then of current humans to look back all this way in time right yeah so the method allows them to reconstruct ancient population dynamics using genetic data from present-day humans by constructing a complex family tree of genes and then examining the finer branches of the tree with greater precision than before to identify significant evolutionary events that's wild that they can do that and so they've seen this i guess it's like a bottleneck right that lasted quite a long time i mean it obviously still is in our genes that they can see it but has that had an impact on the sort of subsequent hominin evolution yeah so the researchers think this had a big impact on the evolution of humans so they estimate around 98.7 percent of the human ancestor population was lost Ouch. and during this time there were genetic changes that they've seen there's chromosomes that merge together in this period and so they think it's possible that this period led to the emergence of the last common ancestor of Denisovans, Neanderthals, and modern humans. And that the mysterious species in question were more similar to Homo heidelbergensis, the archaic human species considered to be the last common ancestor between Neanderthals and modern humans. And in another twist, the researchers proposed that the survivors of this event may have been the ones who actually evolved into Heidelbergensis. It's estimated that by 813,000 years ago, the number of archaic humans had jumped by over 2,000%. Quite the comeback story. People denying the hypothesis as a whole, while others disagreeing that climate was to blame or that the proposed timings mentioned are incorrect. 
certain individuals even think there was no extinction event, period, with their hypothesis being that something more random, like a genetic mutation, took place, which technically could have given one population a big edge over the others. Even the scientists who wrote the paper have said that follow-up research needs to take place in order to confirm the accuracy of their bottleneck suggestion. As an independent team found that while the bottleneck likely did happen, it may have taken place earlier than first thought, playing out over a million years ago. If true, it would prove that the 0.9 MA event was not the main culprit behind our ancestors' near extinction. But of course, another study has also come out that actually backs the original paper and its timings although disagree that the cold was solely to blame. In 1816, our planet experienced one of the earliest recorded instances of global climate change. It all started with the 1815 eruption of Indonesia's Mount Tambora, which spurred droughts and crop failures, altered weather systems, triggered disease, and destabilized regimes. So, today we're going to take a look at why 1816 is known as the year without a summer. Mount Tambora, also known as Tamboro, is located in West Nusa Tenggara, in the northern part of Sumbawa, on one of the lesser Sunda Islands of Indonesia. Its 1815 eruption is the largest recorded volcanic eruption in human history, with some scientists believing it to be four to ten times as mighty as the eruption of Krakatau in 1883. In the aftermath, the world faced one of its most significant and challenging geological events. However, a while passed before the world felt Tambora's effect. As the enormous ash plume made its way across the world, it put additional pressure on all of these situations. and wreaked havoc on entire communities. The event began with an initial eruption in 1815. Despite its moderate size, this first eruption
description was accompanied by a detonation sound so loud it could be heard nearly 900 miles away. The following day, volcanic ash began to fall in Java, and additional eruptive noises, similar to the sound of guns being fired, could be heard a full 1,600 miles away on Sumatra. By that night, columns of flame rose into the sky, and Mount Tambora itself was covered by fire. Pumice rained down from the sky, and lava flowed down all sides of the volcano to the sea, completely destroying the village of Tambora. Analysts disagree on an exact number of lives lost due to Mount Tambora's eruption. However, even the most conservative estimates suggest around 10,000 people perished from pyroclastic flows during the initial eruption, and another 70,000 passed in the subsequent months from disease and hunger. To drive home the fact that the eruption was the largest volcanic event in modern history, the 1815 burst garnered a volcanic explosivity index of 7 on a scale that goes up to 8. But back in 1816, the eruption of Mount Tambora caused a similarly troublesome bout of global cooling to the tune of 3 degrees. Though a 3 degree temperature drop may not sound particularly profound, this change in weather actually had wide-reaching consequences. The ash cloud generated by the volcano made its way to the stratosphere, reflecting incoming sunlight and cooling the Earth. The wind disrupted weather systems and increased rainfall across much of the Northern Hemisphere. Europe, China, and even North America all experienced below average temperatures that year, and entire harvests were ruined. Switzerland saw an ice dam form in the middle of the summer, and China and India documented disruptions to the monsoons which caused flooding. Insist a different series of potato famines affected the country in the 18th and 19th centuries. These earlier famines are believed to be caused by Mount Tambora's eruption, which caused an eight-week-long rainy period in Ireland. As a result, local crops failed and famine ensued, leading to a typhus epidemic from 1816 to 1819. Roughly 100,000 people perished. The eruption caused ash, rain, and freezing temperatures to circulate throughout the continent. Hardly anyone was prepared for these effects, and food stores were low.
As the strife disrupted agricultural processes, many European nations found themselves having to rely on American imports to avoid widespread starvation. While the eruption affected people globally, the most dramatic consequences occurred closer to the volcano. For instance, the annual Indian monsoon slowed down, leading to a dizzying array of effects like the aforementioned cholera epidemic that started in Bengal. Mount Tambora also emitted a substantial amount of sulfate. According to historian Gillen Darcy Wood, the massive load of sulfate gases Tambora injected into the stratosphere produced an aerial dust cloud consisting of up to 100 cubic kilometers of debris. This great sun-obscuring plume then circled the Earth at the equator in a matter of weeks before drifting poleward. He also said that this plume would have played havoc with the world's major weather systems for almost three years. Thank you. 